This is Jerry Hocek from Natural Awakenings Magazine and PlanetJersey.com. I'm here today with Dr. Douglas Pucci, functional medicine doctor from Oradell, New Jersey. And his website is getwell-now.com. Hi, Dr. Pucci. <laughs> hey, Jerry. Nice to be here with you today. Dr. Pucci has some real... Um, I would say bleeding edge. He's even beyond cutting edge um, equipment and modalities. A lot of different uh, tools that he uses here to do diagnostics and, and, and as well as getting folks better. You know, we, we always hear this stat that, that America is the sickest nation in, in the world. Well, we we're one of the wealthiest you know, nations right in the world, and yet we're literally the, the sickest, the most unhealthy population as far as the industrialized world goes. Right. right, and I don't know the exact statistics, but I know that it's it's probably roughly that we consume about seventy five percent of the world's pharmaceutical drugs. Really, is yeah. that that? that we're leading the world in obesity and 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 diabetes, and and we have uh, an explosion of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's now. You know, so we're really not doing better at this. We're really getting sicker as a nation, right? And and you know, we're starting. The trend is starting to change. People are becoming a little bit more learned in nutrition and and thinking about some. I guess you would call them alternative treatments like acupuncture, uh, even chiropractic, uh, homeopathy and whatnot. And I kind of joke with my patients too. I'm always like, when did natural approaches to health become alternative? Right. right? <laughs> well, and, yeah. and, 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 and treating people with multiple drugs and, and is, is, is the norm today. Uh, but, I, but, you know, we talked earlier, Jerry, right? And there is kind of a change taking place. I think you're finding that people more and more are, are definitely looking to take some responsibility. They're looking to get some control back. Uh, they don't want to be utilizing drugs. They don't want to be dependent upon drugs. That even said, we all, can, we all even know now that we have a tremendous opioid problem in this country. Yes, we right? do. And New yeah. Jersey specifically is in, the, is, is in the, the leading of this, right? Opioids you know, and, and, and heroin addiction. That's right. We have the ports here, uh, um, uh, Patterson, New Jersey, a, a big distribution point for the drug. And... Uh, and, 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 and besides that, I mean, oxycodone and, and some of these other pharmaceuticals have gotten very popular because the, the doctors have just been writing scripts for them, uh, and, and I think haphazardly as well. And, and, it's in, and so we're at the point now where it's a well-known fact that, that this has hit crisis proportions in, in the United States. It has hit a crisis proportion, um, and it just shows you really the, the degree over how many people are truly suffering. Right. So, so this is kind of almost. Uh, I think a lot of what we've been doing in medicine has kind of gotten away from us. It's unraveled a bit, I, I would say. And and so, what 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 do people come to a functional medicine doctor for? Well, let's what just is, let's just start with this. Let's just sure. understand some of the differences. I mean, yeah. You know, this is not about anti-medicine or anti-traditional. Absolutely. Allopathic. Absolutely. You know, there's a time and a place for everyone here, and, and medicine will certainly you know excel in acute intervention. Right? I mean, absolutely. God forbid, but I mean, if you're having a heart attack, you know, don't come here and get to the emergency room. You save your life, right? Right. But my role is then what do you do when you get safe from the heart attack and how does your life move forward so that we can get you healthy and not have the heart attack in the future, right? So the role that I play in, in a functional approach is really getting to understand what is that the, the, the underlying root causes of people's chronic health conditions. And so, yeah, many people who know me know me as kind of the hormone guy or specializing in thyroid. And, and that's true, but there's so much more that we do here. We see patients with all types of things, right? We have patients in the office um, with, you know, severe digestive problems. We have people in here with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, patients with MS. Um, just for the clarification, so if anybody else is hearing this, is that legally I am not treating MS. Right. But I am treating the person who has the MS, right? So Absolutely. We're not, so we're not chasing the diagnosis. We're, we're, so we're really looking for what is the underlying cause. And you're looking at the whole person. In looking functional, at the whole person. In functional medicine, you're looking at the entire person. Systemic. Right. What, it, what is causing this, this condition? Yeah, uh, plural. Um, uh, conditions. Conditions. <laughs> conditions. <laughs> right. You know, and causes, you know, plural. So the majority of the people that come into this office, all right, that seek me out, I'm not the first doctor that they're coming to see. Usually the last. I'm <laughs> usually the last. I'm the, you know, I'm the last hope. Right. Or one of the last. <laughs> you know, basically. Uh, the most common thing that I hear that people say, that we know, actually I tell them, right, is they start off in their primary doctor's office. Their primary doctor, you know, sends them, say, uh, to the endocrinologist because he sees maybe some markers and says, I think you have a thyroid issue, and he sends them to the endocrinologist. 
the endocrinologist, you know, diagnoses them with hypothyroidism and puts them on, you know, hormone replacement medication. Okay. Fair enough. The patient goes home and starts the medication, right? The doctor has them come back in several weeks or a month or so and they run a new blood test, right? And they're looking to see if the, the marker, in this case TSH, is starting to fall into normal ranges. If it drops but it hasn't reached normal ranges, the medication prescription increases. Okay? And they keep doing this until they get your TSH into normal ranges. So what's happening in this field is that when you go back to the doctor is, and he runs his follow-up tests, uh, what the doctor is actually managing is the prescription. Who are managing the, stats? The, well, they're, yeah, they're managing the drug that they're prescribing. Should I increase the dosage, lower the dosage, or leave it the same? Once they get your TSH into normal range, they say everything's good, your test is normal. So because you have continued complaints, say it's gastric problems, they say, well, my job is done, and they send you over to the gastroenterologist. So the gastroenterologist runs a bunch of tests. He can't find something wrong with you. You got joint pain. They send you over to the rheumatologist. So it's a very common scenario. It's a very common I, scenario. I've heard of this. Where people are seeing numerous doctors. They're, they're bouncing around like a pinball from the rheumatologist to the gastroenterologist, back to the endocrinologist, back to the primary guy, back to the endocrinologist. You know, at some point, you know, no one's really listening. It's, it's kind of like it's falling on deaf ears. The patient then turns to what? They turn to the internet. And they start Googling for information, right? And they start reading about other things like alternative care and nutrition, right? which is great too, but there's a tremendous amount of information out there, right? And it's really hard to decipher this. So they, they begin to self-prescribe nutrition for themselves. And they start trying all kinds of different things and adding piles and piles of nutritional products in without even really understanding that some of that's good and some of that may be harmful, right? If taken right. In, the right, in, the, in the right dosaging or conflicting things and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so it, it, yeah. it, it's happened to me actually. I, yeah. I, I was seeing uh, uh, someone in, in, in functional medicine, I mean, you know, a few years ago in Bergen County, and uh, it, it was standard process, but she was over prescribing all these supplements uh, to the point where I was getting uh, telltale signs in my skin that my liver was being affected because it wasn't able to process all of these supplements. So, well, okay, that's great. It brings me to a point which is this whole idea or concept about functional medicine mm -hmm. and what it is and what's a functional doctor and so on and so forth. And I can tell you this, you know, many people out there have, know, have heard of functional medicine. Yes. Uh, we kind of get a sense that we want to be able to kind of find how organ systems are actually functioning. Right. But, there's a, but I can tell you from my own experience, right? But I, I'll yeah. tell you, this person didn't have the knowledge and experience that you did. This was a, a, more of a kind right. of a game well, that's what I'm saying. to her. Yeah. And, that, and, and I wasn't in the right, I, was, I wasn't uh, being taken care of by, by the right hands, so to Just speak. because right. someone says they're a functional doctor. Right. Or, or naturopath or whatever, it doesn't mean that they have... There's the, functional doctors and then there's functional doctors. Right, right, right. right Depending right, upon the degree of experience right, and training right. and, and there's so a guy, so forth. There's a guy playing around with the car engine in his driveway and then there's the, the class, or what do you call Class A mechanic yeah, at, well, at the Mercedes dealership. Well, let me share it this way. Is right. that, you know, I hear it all the time that some medical people are starting to move into understanding more about functional medicine and trying to integrate it into their practice. So, um you know, first of all, the reason why medical doctors aren't really going into this route is, is that it's, it's too time-consuming to relearn a lot of things. Right. It's, 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 it's costly, you know, so... And it's, they have it's overhead. Just, it's, it, it's just too difficult, yeah. right? All right, but for the ones that do it that, out there, what they're doing basically is they're going out to a weekend seminar course put on by a laboratory. They're learning how to read a couple of lab tests. Mm -hmm. And then they're told by these companies, these are the nutritional product that you give based upon the lab results. So what they're doing is they're still treating the patient from an allopathic model, but they run a couple of tests and they start just throwing a lot of supplements at them. Right. That's not really functional. Okay, right. right? That's and, not functional. And thank you. Thank you so much for bringing that up because that is prevalent out there. We, mm -hmm. we know that, especially today with all right. this focus on home homeopathy and, and supplements and everything. Right. How are you different? Well, I always, this is the thing I always paint to patients is that a true functional doctor never stops asking the question why. There's always the why question behind something. It's a discovery process, right? It's simply put, if you have high blood pressure, the doctor puts you on blood pressure medication. It works, right? It lowers your blood pressure. Absolutely. Right. In most cases. But how long do you have to be on the medication for? Hopefully not too long. No, the rest of your life. If you ask the doctor, right. when can I come off the blood pressure medication, he says never. Because if you come off the medication, the blood pressure goes right back up. So all the medication is doing is suppressing the, 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 the pressure from rising. But it's not addressing why 
you have high blood pressure. There's got to be reasons why you have high blood pressure. Because you're not addressing the reasons why, the cause of the problem, eventually the body's going to give you something else. And let's say it gives you gastric issues. So then you went up in the gastroenterologist's office, he puts you on Zantac or Prilosec, whatever he wants to do, right? And he tries to pacify your, your acid reflux. And, you know, the reason, but he's still not addressing the underlying root causes, right? Because you stop the medication, the acid reflux returns again. So now you're living on two different medications, but the causation of why you're manifesting symptoms is not being addressed. And this is a typical thing that rolls along. So even when you go to a doctor who's saying they're claiming to be a functional doctor, okay, is that uh, they may run a couple of tests, but the information they're getting back is still not comprehensive enough. There's still not a deep enough investigation. When I'm working with patients, the, the questions never stop of the why. Right, right. Because even when we get a test result back that can show that a person's liver function isn't correct, or they're not metabolizing B vitamins correctly, is it just simply as just giving more B vitamins, or is there a, again a deeper discovery as to why they're not metabolizing the B vitamins mm -hmm. correctly? Well, it would be a mechanism in the body that's not performing the way it's supposed to perform, and 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 then there's a reason behind that. I, mean, I would think there's reasons behind that, and then there's reasons behind that. So you you you're you're the type of uh, professional that just c keeps digging and digging. Yeah, so let me let me pull a few uh, more things together sure. for you. Just to kind of, I think for your audience, I think for your audience, this will be a little bit more helpful from a visual standpoint and a little mm -hmm. bit more simplified, right? Is science said to us uh, roughly 20 years ago they discovered what they now call a super system of the body, and that super system is known as the neuroendocrine immune super system. And what that means, more, more simply in English, is neuro refers to your brain. Endocrine refers to not just your thyroid, but all the hormones of your body. Okay? And your immune system is, you know, 70% is in your gut. So really what you have is you have a brain, hormone, gut, slash, immune super system. It's one integral system. So there isn't any person who's walking into this office that has a thyroid problem, thyroid dysfunction, or any hormone imbalance that does not have also dysfunction with their immune system and dysfunction neurologically with brain. You can't have one without the other. Understood. And so even when you're treating a person, even simply with, with the thyroid dysfunction or hypothyroidism, you, you, you can't just treat it by just giving them replacement hormones without addressing brain and without addressing you know, immune issues. Because there's a direct connection between if a person has immune dysregulation, whether it's due to infections in the gut or, or, or mercury or something else, that's not going to create stresses and or balances with the thyroid. So you have to be able to approach this, all of those simultaneously, okay? And, and, and as I, as a provider, I'm deciding on which things take priority and how you support all of things, all those mechanisms together. There was an article written in Time magazine. I forget when it was. It's several years ago. But the, 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 the cover of the magazine stated quickly is inflammation. The term was inflammation, and it was the common link between all chronic degenerative diseases including cancer, heart disease, and Alzheimer's. So what you, we really are discovering today, what we really are aware of today, is that the, the common denominator, it doesn't make a difference what the diagnosis is, what label you put on something, right. whether you call it a gastritis, whether you call it hypothyroidism, you know, whether you call it cerebellar ataxia, whether you call it you know, brain fog, whether you, whatever, <laughs> rheumatoid arthritis, the common denominator Mm -hmm. is inflammation. Even cardiovascular disease is well known to be a, is an inflammatory response in the cardiovascular system. So is our, our wonderful American diet causing most it's of this It's a major contributor to it. It is. There's no doubt about it, but it's not the only thing. It's not the only thing, but certainly it's a, it's a big player. Right. Right. Um, let me just sure, pull a few things together and mm -hmm. I'll come back to the dietary component mm -hmm. for you and how it is that we would handle a particular patient. Right. So when you're looking at the, if, if really, if, if inflammation is really at the root or the common denominator between all chronic. And when I say chronic, that means just ongoing. That means longer than yes. six Long months. Long term. It's on for six months, and, you right. know, and things aren't getting up. I don't care if it's joint pain, muscle pains, brain fog, headaches, thyroid dysregulation. What's the body telling us something's wrong? Come on. Right. Like, so right? <laughs> the question that you should be asking, that your audience should be asking truly, is what is causing inflammation? That's what you want to know. Right. Right? Sure. Okay, so treating somebody with, you know, with, with thyroid hormone replacement isn't addressing what's causing inflammation. So what might be causing inflammation, right? So you have everything from, number one, you have physiological stressors to the body, number one being blood sugar. Mm -hmm. So any, any blood sugar dysregulation, too low, too high, insulin resistance to hypoglycemia, okay, is, a, is the body's primary stress response. 
which means you're going to start now causing stress hormones, specifically cortisol, to be released. And now you're going to start having the effects of cortisol, right? And cortisol is going to do a lot of different things. True. Right? So cortisol, all right, cortisol has a direct impact on brain health, brain physiology, all right? It, it literally beats up, it degenerates the hippocampus of the brain. The hippocampus of the brain is your short-term memory area. So when you have ongoing you know, cortisol surges, you're inevitably going to have short-term memory problems. So just for the audience, it's not an aging thing. Short-term memory <laughs> loss is not an aging thing. I remember everybody, your article. Yeah. Everybody says that. It, it, it is not. I have people in their 20s with short-term memory problems. Okay. Can we reverse those memory problems? Yes, you can. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you have to have you have to have a I guess a, a, a two prong approach so just in answering about the memory problems is number one is if you think about memory problems you're thinking about inflammation in the brain all right so the first thing you got to do is you got to quench the inflammation all right all right you asked about food so number one is we eat every day i kind of joke with my patients <laughs> and what i say to them is this you know why don't we talk we do talk about food we do talk about uh, dietary protocols when they first get started and I would tell you that, you know, 99.9% .9 of our patients will start on an anti-inflammatory diet. Right. All right. That's not a paleo diet. That's not an Atkins diet. That's not a Mediterranean diet. It is exactly what it sounds like. It's an anti-inflammatory diet. The intention is to drive down inflammation. I joke with my patients. I say to them, look, if you and I ate four times a year, we would not even talk about diet at all. It would not make a difference what you put in your mouth. But we eat every day and several times a day. So it's pretty critical since we're putting food into our mouth and it's going into our gut, which is 70% of your immune system, then the food you're putting into your mouth is going to have a direct impact on immune function. And the food that you're eating is not neutral. It's either going to be anti-inflammatory, nutritionally dense and helpful, or it's going to be inflammatory. It's, right. it's not really in between. So if you're coming into this office and you're coming in and you're, you're in an inflamed state, it would behoove you to put some attention <laughs> to the foods and, you and think? Uh, <laughs> remove the inflammatory things. Because what it is, and again, I'm using, I like to use analogies, but you know, I say to my patients, if your house was burning down, who would you call? Fire department. You call the fire department. That's right. But if I'm standing in the backyard with gallons of gasoline and I'm tossing it into the burning house, the fire department's going to quit. Because they're going to say, you're not even giving me a chance to put out the fire. And it's the same concept. So we can't even get further into really helping patients with the real issues right. if they continue to just eat burgers their diet and, white and rice eat inflammatory and, thing. Yeah. Because you're never going to get a chance to really dampen stuff. Okay? Right. So let's say they participate in that. And that's great. We get a good handle. Now they're taking some responsibility. They're kind of working with an anti-inflammatory diet. Then what's next? That's when we got to start doing some really good investigation. We got to start running some good functional lab interpretations, right? Um, but let's back up again for a second. So, uh, what are the main causes of inflammation? We started saying, okay, number one is blood sugar. So, that priority, if a person has blood sugar dysregulations, that has to be addressed and it has to be re regulated. And we teach people how to do that. Number two, do they have under, other underlying physiological conditions such as anemia? Again, very, very common. Now, you don't hear it diagnosed very much in the traditional medical model because there are parameters for diagnosing that are too large. Right. But when we look at it from a functional standpoint, people, are, you know, half, half my clients are walking around functionally with anemia, which means, poor, really? uh, yeah, which means poor oxygen delivery. You can't get oxygen to your cells. Your cells can't make energy. Okay, it's as simple as that. So it has nothing to do with it not eating enough liver? Or, or... No, 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 okay. no, no. Right? Huh. And... You know, if you're talking about brain, if you're talking about, you know, memory problems, if you're talking about dementia or Alzheimer's or any of those kinds of different things, right? What it all boils down to is what? Is can the neurons, the cells in your brain, have sufficient energy to perform their jobs correctly, right? So what we're talking about really is, is energy production problems. The reasons why neurons, you know, brain cells uh, don't perform correctly and or they die prematurely is because it's not sufficient energy. Right. So this is where your thyroid comes in because your thyroid hormones participate in metabolism or any energy production. So your thyroid, your thyroid hormones, your thyroid physiology has a direct impact on brain health. Right. And I want to stop yeah. you right there. Um, yeah. You also, which I, I thought was very, um, how would you say, in, very insightful of you. We were talking about the emotional component also in all this. Mm -hmm. right? The yeah. last time I was here, uh, that that plays also a huge factor in physical health. Right. Uh, unresolved traumas, um, d d dysfunctional uh, ongoing relationships that, that need to perhaps be, uh, you know, 
have yeah. the association has to be different or or the relationship needs to be ended or whatever but um i mean people are engaged in 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 these type of dynamics as well that that's ha and it's having an impact on their health so so i mean are you are you addressing some of that those issues when when they i mean i know you're not a, a social worker or a psychiatrist no but no but that's a good point jerry and yes and, abs and yeah we absolutely do that or obviously you know we want to get you know, a person let's say use an example a person is um uh, coming in and they're having difficulties at home in their marriage, or they're really distressed out with their, 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 their children. Um, uh, as a small example, I'm not even going back into sure. traumas when they're Absolutely. children, but they're coming in and there's just a lot of emotional needs and stresses and stuff. Those things are having impacts on hormones, are having impacts on their cortisol. So maybe initially we're taking the the, the front road of, of trying to re-regulate the hormones and support the hormones and downregulate cortisol, but at some point we're gonna need to address some of those emotional barriers too. Now, you know, I'm only gonna go there if the patient themselves Absol wants to go there, Absolutely. right? You know, Absolutely. If they don't wanna go there, we don't go there. Right. Right, if they feel they have it handled with their psychotherapist, uh, that's perfectly fine. But very often the world that I work in is we can tap into these things and we can use useful techniques and strategies uh, to help them at least calm down or less intensify some of these emotional things mm -hmm. so that they get you know get, get better results. Okay. Okay. So so um, I this this has been a lot of wonderful information I think and and for folks that that. Um, you know, can can grasp a lot of this. Um, I, I'm sure they're getting a clear picture of the type of um, type of doctor you are. Um, but what what does all this mean? You know, for the everyday just person walking on the street, um, what is, maybe four things you'd like to see your patients doing more, or 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 just uh, anyone in general, um, or or the society at large. Um, changes in diet, I would think, right? Uh, let much less sugar or no sugar. Um, I mean, what, what, just everyday kind of, uh, if you had to make a list for someone that they would stick on their refrigerator, uh, as far as being more responsible for their health, what are four or five things? Well, the things? things that a person can do for themselves day right. in and day out, right, is obviously number one is diet. Right. But we talked about, we talked about that earlier, right? Just being more conscious about what you're eating. You know, obviously, yes, lowering the sugar intake. More you know, vegetables. Re, re, you know, lessening the load on grains. Right. Grains are an inflammatory food, no matter how you look at it. Your immune system reacts to very numerous components in grain, uh, which means basically what? you got to reduce the bread or eliminate the bread, the pastas, you know, right. things of that nature. Yes. Right? You get, definitely have to increase more, uh, you know, colorful fruits, vegetables. Uh, Grass-fed beef, really important. Yes. Okay? For those of you who are not, you know, meat eaters who are vegetarians and vegans, um, you know, then a little more special requirements. Yeah. Obviously, looking at your B twelve levels and getting your protein intake from other things too. Body likes fat. Body likes so, cholesterol. So the right? diet is obviously very important. You know, mm -hmm. and it's really, again, the patients who are walking in here, they need they're, they're they're not in good shape. They need to make more aggressive changes. Right. Right. And that's key. All right. Number two, you're asking me four proper things. Exercise. Or three. Right? These yeah. are obvious things, right? But we all know we need to exercise more. And right. it doesn't have to be curmudgeon. It could be things that you like to do. Even just getting outside and walking in the trail in the park or something is... Right. Is walking in the neighborhood things. even, right? If you walking don't have in the limited time. Or... Just to some degree of activity. Right. Right. Needs to be good. Probably a little bit less TV time. Probably a little bit less well, internet A little time. less smartphone, right? huh? But mostly, mostly <laughs> because, the smartphone, mostly because of the EMFs. Right. I mean, right, now you yeah. may want to don't, don't hear about it, but I mean, the, the research is pretty clear, right? Is that the world is out, the world, our country is on a bad electrical grid, and we have use of all these electrical tools and stuff, and they are very disruptive. The Wi Fi's, I mean, the, the cell mm. phone towers are very disruptive to our normal DNA. Right. And so, if you look back over the studies over the last several decades, there's a direct correlation between increasing EMFs and the increase in autisms and increasing cancers and stuff. So, you know, mitigating or minimizing some of the EMF exposure, or at least protecting yourself a little bit, is quite helpful. Obviously, sleep. Now, these are easy things for me to sleep. say, yeah. right? The point is, people come in here and they all are insomniacs. Well, how do right. I sleep more? So that's well, that's the whole point. Yeah. So, you're giving you like four or five bullet points about what people can do is nice, but mm -hmm. the reality is that the majority of things they, can, they that they really need help on, they can't do by themselves. They need someone like myself to come in, start running the right tests, start prioritizing things. Let me take a step back, because I don't think I fully answered the question about truly about the inflammatory thing, yes. which is really at the root of everything because when you have inflammation you're going to have an immune system reactivity. If you talk to anybody in the know today, right, what we're really dealing with when it's a inflammation is you're you're dealing with immune reactivity. Understood. So what we're really saying is that all of these degenerative diseases and conditions and mental decline is all due to immune 
dysregulation, right? So it's really an immune game that we're really talking about, right? So the, the, the inflammation is being driven by not just your blood sugar, not just anemia, but things like underlying infections, be viral, bacterial, parasitic, okay? They're being driven by environmental toxins, your pesticides, your herbicides, your fungicides, the glyphosates, yes. the VOCs, the GMOs, you know, everything right. that we're being talking about. In your food sources, we're filled with you know yellow dyes and red dyes and preservatives yeah. and ke chemicals and so, pesticides, right? We have heavy metal toxicities. We have mercury, right? So all of these things we all have. But the reality is, is that we live in a toxic world and we're all toxic. And each generation carries even more, to more a larger toxic burden with us. So the body does a pretty good job in adapting to that, but eventually it starts to get overwhelmed. You hit saturation points. Right. And it's really the immune system trying to adapt and to struggle to these related toxins. So you really can't even calm down the, the inflammation and start getting the person back on the right track until you start to get these, this toxic load burdened. And here's another thing that I'm going to tell you that I hear all the time in my office is that people hear this and they want to run to the local, you know, uh, health food store, and they want to start doing their own detoxes. You know, they start taking oh. over-the-counter detoxes. Right. Now, you know, there's a difference between, you know, eliminating toxins and moving toxins. And so one of the dangers in detoxification, self-prescribed detoxification, is they wind up moving a chemical or a toxin like mercury or metal from one part of their body, and they don't actually excrete it. They wind up redistributing it. And the two places it's going to go to is your liver and to your brain. Right. Okay. And then you have a whole new set of problems coming on. Okay. So I, I err in a side of caution that I wouldn't just willy nilly be out there trying to do your own kind of detoxification. And now I'm not talking about healthy bowel movements. That's detoxification, right? Right. So a person should have <laughs> be moving their bowels on a daily basis, right? I'm talking about self prescribed or taking the cleanses and purges. Cleanses and and, and, right, right, right. And and uh, what what are these 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 uh, uh, fast diets that? Yeah, because most of the time, most of the time you're taking these these types of diets is you have no idea. In most cases, your your liver, your lymphatic system, your kidneys, they're in no shape to handle it. Right. And now you're dumping all this stuff into a very delicate kidney and creating you know more more problems. So I always encourage people when I. Yeah, to, to, to try to not, not do that, all right? Yeah, I would think. I would think they would need uh, some guidance with that uh, yeah. to, 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 do, to do it properly and get, get, get yeah, desirable, so let me, desirable this, results. So let I me decide. Think. You know, yeah. we had talked about this earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Is what happens when a patient walks into this office, right? So we always begin by, by doing a thorough consultation history with the patient, sure. seeing who they're seeing, what's working, what's been dealing with, how long they've been dealing with certain conditions, what medications you're taking, even what nutritional products they're taking, and how long, and so on and so forth. From that point, we're going to work a person through a comprehensive neurological evaluation. Neurological evaluation means we want to know how well balanced the right and left hemispheres of the brain are. Are we seeing anything there uh, that needs to be improved upon? Um, we're going to make decisions on what appropriate functional tests would be are necessary. We're always going to start a patient off with a comprehensive blood test. Right. Now, people who also bring in their blood tests, but oftentimes you find that not enough specific tests are run in there plus and so we want to add on certain markers and stuff to give us a little bit more information uh, we always like to run in the beginning a hormone analysis or a hormone test it's important to look at not just the stress hormones like cortisol uh, DHEA but we also want to look at whether it's male or female their estrogen progesterone testosterone levels right okay one of the most common things that's happening in our society today is a switching or an imbalance of hormones what's happening is Men are upregulating up enzyme that's converting their testosterone into estrogen, so they're becoming estrogen dominant. Yes. Women are increasing enzymes that are converting their estrogens into testosterones, right? And these are not healthy because in both men and women, women estrogen is cardioprotective, and so when they, when they have an increase in testosterone, they have cardiovascular risks. Interesting. In men, testosterone is cardioprotective, so when they have estrogen dominance, they have cardiovascular risks. In men, they have more receptors in their frontal lobe of their brain for testosterone. So if they become estrogen dominant, their frontal lobe of the brain declines. So they lose executive function, they lose personality, they lose decision-making processes, and they lose a breaking mechanism. So they have more like anger issues. Hmm. And the same thing goes for women because women have estrogen receptors in the frontal part of their brain. So if they become testosterone dominant, same thing. Frontal lobe starts to shut down. Depression, anger, decision-making processes, and so on and so forth. Right. Yeah. So looking at these hormones is a critical baseline for us to start going that direction, right? Uh, another part of what, our, what we do with our patients is we do, you know, a very specialized type of 
toxicology testing. Yes. As we, as you well know. Yes. Right. So one of the things we want to be able to find out is, you know, is uh, if they do, ha well, we all have mercury. The question is, is it creating a problem? That's the issue. Right. So, right. you know, if you have mercury and it's not really causing a problem, do you want to do something with it? You probably don't. But our testing is able to find not only if you have a mercury issue, where it is, is it in the gut, is it in the liver, is it in the brain, and should or shouldn't it be addressed? Okay. So these are things that we kind of walk the patient through and we do these things through homeopathic type remedies, uh, through nutritional recommendations, through dietary things, and through neurological intervention. So I can just say, you know, one of the things I think that sort of differentiates what I'm doing versus other functional doctors is that we're going beyond just sort of metabolic testing and we're including the neurological component and the immunological component and the toxicology component you know, with the nutrition stuff. So it's really a very comprehensive approach. And, and that's going to that's gonna paint yeah. a clear picture for you as far as what's, really what's going on with the entire person, I would think. Yeah, very much so. Um, so so you, have a, you have a good basis to, to, to start your treatment from. It, it, and a strategy. And, and a strategy. Really, there's a strategy because, you know, no, no, no one strategy is best for everybody. Yes. Right? A woman who just came in very recently um, is having, you would say she's having, you know, severe neurological problems. She's basically, when she was in the office, having seizures. Hmm. Right. And these all became, what happened was, this all happened with a physical trauma to the shoulder. Hmm. And that started to spark some neurological science. And the medical community started to give her, gave her gabapentin to try to calm down her brain. And she had violent reactions to the gabapentin. Wow. So now they have her on uh, L-DOPA, which mm -hmm. is what you give to a Parkinson's patients to try to control movement disorders. Tremors and seizures and stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but the point is, in, in, what I'm saying is in, in, in working with her, now you can't come in and start doing neurological work with her because her brain doesn't have the capacity. Any kind of stimulation I would give her to try to get her brain healthier is going to cause her to, to fatigue and trip into the seizure. Right. So the strategy here is we have to come in, drive that inflammation, and create metabolic stability before we can start to layer in the neurology. Yeah, right. Well, you, you, you have a strategy. There's a strategy. Right. right. And, and based on information, right. uh, uh, I would I would think a fair amount of information that you've collected from your, your own diagnostics here, which which um, right. and, I, and I think these, you know, the procedures out in, in the traditional medical world are kind of more geared for for uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, yeah. treatments. I think you know I want yeah. to talk about one more thing. Yes, yeah. the autoimmune component. Mm -hmm. now, you didn't ask me. I didn't actually bring it up, but I right. think it's important that I actually make some. I think it is as well. This. Yeah, it's huge because I think people are a bit confused. And not getting really good information about this and the right. understanding about this, right? So let's just start with number one is the, 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 the diagnosis of Hashimoto hypothyroid, right? So anybody who has that knows that their diagnosis means they have an autoimmune disease of the thyroid. So your thyroid can slow down, which is known as hypothyroidism. But if you're given the diagnosis of Hashimoto hypothyroid, which is the name of a Japanese doctor, Right? You're clarifying that the reason why you have hypothyroidism is because of an immune system attacking the thyroid. Now, what happens in medicine is your, your primary doctor, your endocrinologist, they very rarely even run the test. What is the test? The test is when you run a traditional blood test, you just ask for antibodies against the thyroid, specifically right. the TPOs and the TBG, and you have an antibody count. Right? If that comes back high or positive according to the lab, it's a clear diagnosis that your condition is Hashimoto's. Your medical doctors typically don't run it. And the reason why they don't run it is because it doesn't change the treatment strategy. Even if they have it, they say, okay, so you have it, and we know over time it's going to be more destruction. We're going to manage it by increasing your prescription of hormones. It's as simple as that. Hmm. So they don't typically run it. The reason why it's getting run is because patients are reading about it and learning more, and they want it run, and they're telling the doctor to run it. So once it gets run, they get the diagnosis, there it is. And when I do my workshops and people come in with Hashimoto's hypothyroidism and they're going to the endocrinologist and they're getting their prescription and they're told everything's okay because the TSH is normal. Right. They still right. feel like crap. They still feel like crap. But what they don't seem to understand is that nobody is really... I should say this. Once you're diagnosed with an autoimmune thyroid or autoimmune anything, it no longer is a thyroid game. It's not a thyroid game. Right, so right. we're not getting down it's, to the root. It's an immune game. Right, right. The, the priorities change. It's an immune game. The analogy I use is that it's like your your thyroid is an innocent victim in a drive-by shooting. <laughs> it needs a little attention, right? Right. If people still run around the neighborhood shooting people, it's going to be more destruction. And that's exactly what happens with autoimmunity. The average adult is going to develop at least four more autoimmune diseases in their life. 
or more averaging, right? That's so the common thing is you get diagnosed with your autoimmune thyroid, it gets managed with your, with your Synthroid, uh, and in a, in a year, year later, your joints are aching, and then you go to a rheumatologist and you're being diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Right. And then you're going to be put on new drugs for the, to try to manage the rheumatoid arthritis, and it continues to progress. So the real question is, why is it progressing? What is it about that's going on? And the reason is, is because your immune system is seeing something. It's seeing something in your thyroid that shouldn't be there, right? Your immune system's job is to protect you. Yes. Not to go after your self tissue. You wouldn't want the United States Marines shooting everybody who lives in New Jersey. You would say, what's up with that, right? What's the reason right. for this, right? Yeah, why so is that, why is that happening? So why is that, that happening? Yeah, why? Why? The why? Reason is, we're back to why. The why is toxins. Right. The why are the toxins that we're accumulating with. So your, your immune system is seeing something there that shouldn't be there. Would you say that most, the majority of the toxins that we're ingesting are, are in the chemicals in the food? I mean, if we're not eating a, a healthy plant-based or mostly plant-based, mostly plant and meat-based diet, you know, or organic meat-based. Uh, food is very important because I said to you, we're eating every single day. Right. So yes, it's obviously yeah. very so, much there. And so you know, chemicals. And wait, wait, look, you gotta do the best you can. Absolutely. Right, so right. you know, right. we're you not gonna eat? avoid all of it. No, so you did the best you can. Right. right? You have to just kind of lower the load a little bit, right? Right, right. So I tell patients, look, you know, is, should you eat organic? Yeah, best scenario, eat yeah, organic. As much but, as possible. As much as possible, but you know, you look at your food budget, and right. some people say, I can't, then you pick, you hedge your bets, right? You, right. you try to at least eat the, the organic foods that, are, that have the higher content of pesticides. Right, right. The you dirty know, or, seven or whatever. Well, I'd rather still right. eat non-organic vegetables than eat a box of Cheerios. Absolutely. That's just hedging that makes, a little that bit. That makes sense. You're hedging right. your bets a little right. bit. Right. My feeling right. about grass-fed meat is really right. strong. No, mine also. I would. Mine also. I, would, I mean, yeah. I at this point, and I didn't do it years ago, but the more I've learned, I've changed. Right. You know, and I keep learning, right. and learning myself too, and things I do yeah. today I didn't even do a year ago. But right. and you know, I've been reading about it, and yeah, I I, I concur. If I'm going to eat totally. beef, it's going to be grass-fed. Grass-fed, hundred percent grass-fed and finished. I'm not going to do it. Right. You want the good fat. You want the fat in it. Too. Right. Right. The omegas. Right. Well, you want the good fat that's mm -hmm. in it. That comes. The, the grass fed beef, the omegas, the essential fats, right? You hear about omega 3s and omega 6s. We hear that omega 3s, you know, are really, we need a lot more omega 3s because the omega 6s are inflammatory and the omega 3s are anti inflammatory. Right. That's partially true. The reality is we need all of them, but we need them in good ratios. They're all very, very critical. So the difference is when you're eating gra a grain fed beef, the typical right. stuff that they're, you buy. They're acidic, those cows. Well, they're filled. They're, they're filled with grain. They don't they're, eat. They're grain. not. They're not built to eat grain. They're, they're, not, they're, they're built they're, to ch chew. They built grass. to chew grass. Yeah. They're supposed to eat grass, right. which is filled with chlorophyll, and it's and it has omega threes and omega six right. in its right ratio, right? Right. So the grain fed animals, the ratio of six to three is like twenty to one. That's very inflammatory. But the ratio oh. in the grass fed is like one to one to two to one. So it's quite healthy. It's quite beneficial. So you really want fatty grass fed beef. Get all those nutrients in from from the from the from the fat. All right, come to your house next uh, Saturday. <laughs> we'll grill some grass-fed burgers. We'll some grass-fed burgers, but, man. Uh, I, I want to thank you for uh, for coming in. And, all right, good. Uh, Enjoyed it. This has been this has been fantastic. Yeah, always good it. to talk to you. I always walk out with much more knowledge than than I had uh, walking in the door. <laughs> and uh, they can see you again on uh, Get Well. It's Get Well hyphen or dash. Yeah, so it's now. G, yeah, G E T W E L L with a middle dash N O W. Dot com get well now dot com dr douglas pucci in oradell new jersey thanks for listening